the kind of favor you have always shown. But you don't have to tell me you proved how much you loved. All right, good evening, everyone, and online. We're going to be go ahead and sing in victory in Jesus. Please stand. Let's sing it out tonight. I heard an old, old story. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary.
to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We'll sing that last verse at home when you get to that chorus. Let's let out that praise God. Here we go on the last. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Praise God, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Thank you for uh, being here, and thank you for watching at home online. And so uh, we're going to open up the service uh, with a word of prayer, so if you'd please join me. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day and for all that you do for us. Lord, we thank you so much for the fact that you resurrected. Lord, many people have gone to the grave, but you came back out. And Father, we're so thankful for that, and we thank you for that. Lord, we ask that you please bless our services here tonight. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll continue singing now, My Savior's Love, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. Let's sing it out. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. On the last, when with a ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me Well, we had a wonderful day today. Um, if you were able to be with us in our parking lot service, it was it was a wonderful time to to uh, to share together. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, I was I was cold. And my like I'm up there trying to move my papers, and my papers aren't moving. I'm like ah, whatever. But no, it was good, and uh, I enjoyed seeing all the faces, all the families. And, uh, and so that was such a blessing. And then our 11 a.m. service, we uh, finished up our, our eyewitness uh, sermon series with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that was enjoyable. And I was talking to, I think, Brother Joe, and I said, man, I'm kind of bummed because I've really enjoyed this ser series, and now I have to, you know, get out of it. Not get out of it, but I have to move on to something else. It's kind of like I knew what I was going to preach the next week going into it. That always makes your week a little bit better, uh, a little bit easier. And so now, so now we'll see we'll see where we go from there. And uh, while I've been while I've been uh, doing this sermon series, I've been um, I, I'll save that story for later. I'll save that story for later. It's during the sermon. 
All right, upcoming events. Um, a couple of things. Number one is the fact that uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, Brother Joe is doing a Zoom uh, Bible study at 1030. If anybody would be interested in that, we'd love to have. Ha Tuesday and Wednesday, is that what I said? Tuesday and Wednesday at, six, at 1030. I'm all over the place. Tuesday and Wednesday at 1030 in the morning, Thursday in the evening. He's doing those, and that's a, that's going to be, um, uh, those are always wonderful times. I'm normally, I'm not there, but I'm there. I like to, like, stand in the cafe and drink my coffee and listen. I haven't, haven't mustered up the, the, the wherewithal to, you know, put my face out there. But uh, I will on Tuesday, actually. Tuesday, the youth group is, I'm going to be organizing one for the youth group. And so I'm going to send out those invites tomorrow to the, to the teenagers and to the parents. And so uh, anybody who wants to be part of that, uh, we, we would love to have you. So I'll be doing that on Tuesday, uh, the Zoom Bible study for the teenagers. And then also, Brother Joe and I, we were talking and, and so I'm going to say it to put our feet to the fire a little bit. We're working on um, getting some children's materials out because, you know, we, want, we have church and, and uh, the Zoom meetings are mostly for adults. And I'm going to have something for the teenagers. We want to get something for the kids, um, you know, maybe, maybe record a, a, a children's Bible story or something of that nature for the children. So they would have something to watch throughout the week as well. And then I hope last month you enjoyed having the... Uh, the uh, Baptist Chronicle come out, and uh, we're going to be starting. We're going to be revamping that and working on that again in the upcoming weeks. So, just just things that we're doing during this time that um that uh that are a little bit different than the way we've uh, ministered before. And so, um, it's always it's always exciting to do, the, do things differently. Um, I I haven't mentioned it much uh, today because I wanted to focus on the resurrection, but. Um, let's make sure that we are still caring and praying and, and ministering to those uh, during this time of the, of the coronavirus pandemic, that we are still showing the love of Jesus. We're still trying to minister in any way that we can. And so um, let's not forget that. I know we kind of, at least in my mind, I tried to put that a little bit to the side today and focus on the resurrection but um, we're going to have to pick that back up and start and, and realize and and serve people and and help people during this time. People, people are having a hard time, and that what a wonderful time then to share the love of Christ with them. So um, those are a couple things coming up uh, throughout the course. And then also, any um, if you at home are in need of something, um, a run to the grocery store, someone to talk to, some counsel or anything of that nature. Uh, it would definitely be our pleasure to assist you in any way possible. And so uh, we've been calling the church family every week, and we're going to continue doing that. And just if there ever is a need or you, you, you need something, by all means, please let us know, and, and uh, we will, we will insist in, assist in any way possible. All right, and uh, now we have another song, Brother Joe. We'll be singing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, three verses of this great song. Let's sing it out. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. Contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did small 
love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all amen all right and this is the time of our service where we would normally have the offering and I just want to remind those of you that are at home, uh, number one, I just want to, of course, say thank you for your faithfulness and in, in the giving during this time. Um, but number two, um, if you want to give, there's a multiple ways you can give. You can send a check here uh, through the mail, and we get those on a weekly basis, and then we, um, you know, we deposit them and take care of them and, and track them. So you can either mail it here, or you can go to our website, CBC Smith Creek, and uh, cbcsmithcreek.com. Uh, there's a button that says either give online or there's another one that says give to spread the gospel. Go ahead, click on that, and it'll send you to our giving page. It's really simple to follow. You don't have to register. You, uh, for tracking purposes, if you want to track it or help track it, um, you will, you'll want to create one. But just so you know, you don't necessarily have to. You can, what it says, give as a guest. But I would recommend if you want it to be tracked that you would give as a or you would sign up and then give that way. And I know a lot of people have started doing that and it's been a it's been a blessing. And so those are those are a few ways that you can you can still give to the to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, during this time. And now we're going to have our special and our special is going to be the old rugged cross. Cross, the emblem of suffering. 
Thank you for that. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 15. The thing I was going to mention earlier is uh, I've really enjoyed my Sunday morning sermon series on John and the miracles. But as I've been studying throughout, you know, the last six, seven weeks or whatever, I've been, you know, reading the stuff in between, too. So I have like all of these sermons in John that I've just written. And uh, and so I've, I but I was kind of like, I don't want to spend too much time in John in the beginning. So um, so I wouldn't I would preach other things. But so I have a lot of other sermons in John. And so this is going to be one of them. And so we're in John chapter 15, John chapter number 15. Um And as today is Easter, um, Jesus has resurrected from the dead, and uh, but this sermon is more uh, talk. It's 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 titled "Jesus is our strength." Jesus is our strength, and so we're going to look at this story here in John chapter 15, and we're going to pull some truths out of it, and then. Uh, go our separate ways. And so John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, out of respect to God's word, I ask that you please stand. John chapter 15, chapters 1 through 5. Uh, this morning I read 10 verses, and I, and I read them myself, but what we'll do this evening, I'll read the odds. You can join me on the e- evens from home, or uh, and so we'll go from there as well. Uh, I'll read the evens. You can join on the odds of John chapter 15, verse number 1. Ready? I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your goodness in our lives and for all that you do, Lord. We do ask that you please would bless this this time that we are studying your word, looking in your word. Word, I pray that you please bless as I am teaching. Uh, may you give me the words to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I once heard, and uh, of course this is a story, so I, so I don't know the validity of it, but uh, this man was giving an illustration of the of the first time he preached, and and so... He always heard that the, his pastor, whenever, whenever his pastor would preach, he would always pray before and say, Lord, give me the words to say. Help me to say what you want me to say and nothing else. And the, and the man thought, that's how you preach. Like, you just pray to God that he's going to give you the words to say. So he didn't prepare anything, and he kind of got up there, and it was pretty silent. He prayed and said, God, give me the words to say. And he was like, okay, how does this work? <laughs> this isn't working. I have no words. No. Um, so um, that's not how it works. It does take some, uh, it does take a lot of studying, and at least in my, in, on my end it does. Um, maybe not for some other people. But uh, So we're going to talk about Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our strength. And so uh, verse number five we saw there that for without him we can do nothing. We can do nothing without Jesus Christ. The Christian life is Christ leading and living through us. And so if we want to live the Christian life, we have to follow Christ and allow him to live through us. And so let's get a little context of John chapter 15. And this is part of the final instructions and exhortations Jesus gave to his apostles before his arrest and death. And in John chapter 14, in John chapter 14, uh, he comforts them by revealing that He's going to send another, the new ministry of the Holy Spirit as the eternal comforter. He, and he introduces that, and he teaches that, and he comforts them with that. And then at the end of chapter 14, in verse uh, 31, he says, Arise, let us go hence. Arise, let us go hence. And, and so after introducing the Holy Spirit, he says, Hey, let's get up, and let's start heading towards the Garden of Gethsemane. So they're leaving the upper room, and they're heading to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and while... While they travel from the upper room to the garden, Jesus is giving this little talk to them And uh, while they're traveling. And so if you want to show that map up there, and if you can see it, good. If you can't, I'm sorry. But um, it, it shows that, that they're leaving the, the city, and they're walking around the wall, 
And to get to the garden, they have to go through a thing called the Kidron Valley. And, uh, and so many people believe that Jesus gave this parable while he was walking through this valley. And uh, because there was a lot of vineyards among the olive groves. And so Jesus, while he's walking with disciples and teaching, he's using this relationship of a vine and a branch in agriculture to speak of the importance of abiding in him. And now, to them, this all made sense. They were used to vines, branches, husbandmen. You know, I, 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 I was uh, not teaching this sermon, but a different sermon to the, to the teenagers. And they're like, what's a husbandman? You know, like, I don't understand. And so a lot of these terms are a little bit different than what we use in our modern vernacular. But, but, these, but uh, these disciples here, they understood it. And so we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, and we're going to draw, hopefully draw some strength from Jesus. And so number one, my first point, is the source of our strength. The source of our strength. If you look in verse number one, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. And so Jesus, or the vine, is the source of the strength. Some vines and some grapes and whatnot, and you can probably see it. But um, you can see that the branches get their strength from the vine. They are not growing of themselves. They get their strength from the vine. Same is true from a Christian. The source of our strength is Christ. Or the source of our strength is Christ. And he is the only source for the Christian. And he's the only source for the branch. If you look up there, the branches are all growing from the vine. They're not growing really off of other branches even. They're growing from the source, uh, from the vine. And, and, and so there is no abiding or living without receiving life from the true vine. There is no living or abiding without receiving life from the true vine. And so if, you've, if, if you're here or if you're listening at home, I should say, if, if you're listening uh, from wherever you are actually, but if you're listening and you do not and you've never received life from the true vine, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never been born again, as it says in John chapter 3, then this really isn't too much help for you. That you have to be saved. You have to have life first. You have to have life first in order to, uh, to have strength. And so that comes, of course, from salvation and through Jesus Christ. And so the first thing I want to say is here that the branch is the servant. The branch is the servant. If you notice, the branches, or in, in this passage, script, the branches would be the disciples. And, and, and here in the context, as, as he's talking to them, the branches are the disciples. These are the ones that he's, so he's talking to saved people. It's, it's important to know that. He is talking to saved people. Their identification is no longer with the nation of Israel. It's no longer with the religion of the Jews, but their identity is now related to Jesus Christ. Same thing is true for us. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't matter if you come from a good family, from a bad family. It doesn't matter, like, like you know, I, I got a, I'm, I'm a Polish ethnicity of my background, Polish and Italian. That's not where I get my identity from, except on Fat Tuesday when I'm walking around with a bunch of poonchkis because that's what happens when you're Polish. Um, I'm, but, but we get our identity through Christ and what his word says about us. Not what other people say about us, but, but so the branch is the servant to the vine. And the branch gets its identity from the vine. Just like if, if we were to go back, don't go back, but if you, if you were to go back to that picture, all of the fruit that was coming off the vine or off the branches stemmed from the vine. There was not some random vine or some random branch on the vine that had oranges or apples on it. It was a grape vine, and so all the branches got its identity or got its grapes from the vine. Same thing is true with Christ. Same thing is true with us. We get our identity in Christ. We get our identity in Christ. So the first thing we said, the source of our strength, and the source of our strength is Jesus. It is the vine, the true vine. And next we have the sustaining of our strength, the sustaining of our strength. And so, in verse number two, if you want to look at that with me, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And so, first of all, we see purging. Purging. The, the, the sustaining of our strength is found through purging. And so, he, he, he talks to two separate groups here. First group he talks to are the branches not bearing fruit. And so he says here to the branches that are not bearing fruit, he says, every branch, 
or in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And if you know that word taketh away, these branches are in him. Every branch in me. So these branches are in Christ. They are saved. And so if, you, if, if, if we were to take this, this in context, only the 11 disciples are actually with him right now. Uh, Judas is left. And so he's only talking to the saved believers. He's talking to the 11 disciples. Judas is gone. And so Jesus is only speaking to his closest, firmest, following disciples. And so why I say that is because this passage of Scripture is not talking about losing salvation. That's not it at all. This is not talking about losing salvation, nor nor the branches representing those who only profess salvation but are not truly saved. Um, this is not talking about that. This is talking to solidified, solid believers, people that are in the work with Jesus, living with Jesus, going with Jesus, and Judas is gone. And so many of these people, many of these 11, if not all of them, will go and actually die a martyr's death because of their belief. And so, no, this is not talking about losing their salvation. This is not talking about those that only say to be saved, but they're really not. These are believers who are saved, but for some reason, they have stopped bearing fruit. And so, if you, if you, if you notice, the verb beareth in the present tense mean, means an ongoing until they have stopped bearing fruit. So, the implication is that these branches were at one time bearing fruit, and now they're not. And so, if there was a time in our lives where, or, or in, in a Christian's life where we were bearing fruit and then we were not, you know, sometimes there's some purging that's involved in that. And there will be some purging. And it's not always comfortable, not always fun, but the Lord is doing it so that we can become more productive and, and, and become more fruitful. Luke chapter 8 verse 18 says this, Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever faith to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. And so, and so here, just another, another indication that if for a period of time there is a, or if for some reason there were bearing and they're no longer bearing, there is the taking away. And so um, no one can really say when that is, but, you know, that's in, that's in the hand of the Lord. But uh, that truth is still in there. And so first of all, he, he, he talks to the branches that are not bearing fruit. Secondly, he talks to the, to the branches that are bearing fruit. And he says, And every branch that beareth fruit, he purchaseth, it, that it may bring forth more fruit. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that word purgeth means to cleanse, to cleanse from filth, to cleanse from impurity, to prune the trees and vines from useless shoots. And so what, what they would do, and um, you probably have done this with, with plants at home or if you're a gardener of any sort, uh, trees in the backyard or whatever, and you get rid of the worthless branches or you get rid of the things that are not bearing fruit because it's not helping the tree, it's hurting the tree. And so first we have the pruning of the branches. And the branches that are bearing fruit will be trimmed back too. And this is not punishment or chastening, but is to help them grow even more and produce even more fruit in the future. And so um, we have, you probably have rose bushes or some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, flower bush, and you want to prune it and get it down to so that eventually it can produce even more fruit. And um, in the first century, a lot of times, and, and even somewhat today, that plants will be pruned for three years before they're allowed to actually produce fruit. And so three years after it was planted, it'd be pruned to, to a way that it would not produce fruit. So that in that fourth year, when it kind of when it went, it would be very, very fruitful and very, very productive. And so F.B. Meyer puts it this way, the branches of the autumn will, will well repay each stroke of that which keen edge with fuller, richer fruit. So we gain by loss. We live as we die. The inward man is renewed as the outward decays. And that was by F.B. Meyer. And so, so you can kind of see here that, that the purging whether and the and the taking away it's not as a punishment it's to bear more fruit it's not it's it's not something that it's like where where god is punishing us and because purging problem purging doesn't feel good always oh i got to remove this out of my life i got to take this out the lord's leading me this way the lord's leading me that way and it's and it's hard and it and it's not always fun but 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 he's saying 
it's for your good. It's for your good. And so the branches that bear fruit or not bear fruit and the branches that do bear fruit. So the first thing we have, uh, the first way that Jesus sustains our strength is through purging. The second way is through cleansing. In verse number three, cleansing. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And so this speaks now of a process that the first century farmer did in the vineyard. The cleansing, or the cleaning, the cleansing of the, of the branches. And that means to uh, physically clean or purify by fire in a, in a, in a simultude. And so, and, and so uh, it is a physical cleaning that goes through. Cleaning out the impurities makes for strong and healthy branches that will be able to bear good fruit. This will come by the word of God. And this comes by the word of God. And so, so back then they would take off the little notches like on the outside of the branch where maybe a, another branch is trying to grow or there's maybe, maybe there was a root that tried to extend but it couldn't. They would take those off so that no wasted energy would go there. And the same is true with the Christian that there, as we are growing, the word of God is there to cleanse us so that we can become more productive and so that we can have a more fruitful life uh, a more fruitful life and it comes by the word of god james chapter 1 verse 21 puts it this way wherefore lay apart all, all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls and so put all that filthiness put all that superfluity aside and and with meekness accept the word of god john 17 17 says it this way sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth as a Christian is growing, as a Christian is developing, and, and and the growth of a Christian and the development of a Christian actually never stops until we actually reach our end point, which would be Jesus, and and it never stops. And so continually a Christian needs to go back to the Word of God and and go to that and allow the Word of God to transform them and clean them. And so, first of all, we said the source of our strength is Jesus. And then we have the sustaining of our strength. How does Jesus sustain our strength? He does it through purging, and then he does it through cleansing, which is the word of God. And then lastly, point number three, we have the stability of our strength. The stability of our strength. Our, our strength is up and down, but Jesus' strength is always the same. Sometimes we're strong, sometimes we're not, but Jesus is always constant. Verse number four says this, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. And so this passage of Scripture here is talking, and, uh, it, and, and, and he's saying, you don't see a branch of itself disconnected from the vine bearing fruit. It doesn't do that. You may pull a vine or pull a branch off of a vine and it has fruit on it, but it's not going to grow any new fruit unless it's abiding in the vine. The Christian is not going to grow unless it is abiding in Jesus Christ. And so I have an illustration up here. Mordecai Ham, um, all right, first of all, I said the stability of our strength, and that comes from Jesus. Mordecai Ham, he was an evangelist that, that, that traveled. I love that picture. Hear Ham, come hear Ham. I don't know why, why I enjoy that, but I do. Hear Ham. Tonight at 8 p.m. is what that sign says, and that's a picture of him right there, Mordecai Ham. He was, a, he, he, he was an evangelist and traveled around. He, preached, he was preaching in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in 1934, and kind of a great awakening took place. A farmer was deeply moved and was deeply concerned for his, for his, uh, for his city and for his area, and so he decided to call other people and have a uh, prayer meeting together. And so they're praying, and as they prayed, they felt compelled to ask God to raise up a man from their city to carry the gospel to the ends of all the earth. And although they didn't see an immediate answer to their prayers, and the, the great awakening had begun, and the, and the farmer's teenage son was converted during the crusade. And, and so here's the thing. So this father got convicted, or got, I don't know if he got saved or convicted or whatever, but he decided to start this prayer meeting. He said, God... Give us somebody that's going to reach the world with the gospel. And this son's teenage, and this, and this farmer's teenage boy got saved, and this boy would indeed end up taking the gospel to the entire world. This farmer's son's name was Billy Graham. And so, uh, and so good thing that that farmer took the time to pray for a revival 
because it, it allowed Jimmy or B- Billy Graham to be saved. And then he actually fulfilled that prayer where, where he was able to preach the gospel to the entire world, pretty much. And so note, note the word abide there. It means to remain. It means to tarry, to not depart, to continue or wait. And it shows up 11 times in this chapter, whether it's abide, remain, or continue, are used if speaking of remaining in the vine. 11 times in one chapter. There's, there's an emphasis there. The Christian needs to remain or tarry with Christ. There is nothing more important in your life than your relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, today we celebrated the resurrection. You know, uh, we, we, this whole week, maybe, maybe we did a little timeline and we, we looked at the crucifixion. We looked at the burial. We, we looked at the resurrection and, you know, we were moved. But that is not something that should only be done once a year. This should, this should be our sustaining strength. We are to remain and not depart in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what does it mean to abide? It means to be kept, to keep in fellowship with Christ so that his work can work in us and through us to produce fruit. It means that we are keeping fellowship with Christ and so uh, that his life can work in and through us to produce fruit. And that's really what it's all about, keeping in fellowship with Christ, partnering with him as we go throughout our life. And so that was a quote by Warren Worsby. But um, so here's the question, how? That'd be good to know. If, he, if, 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 if he says 11 times that I need to abide or remain, then how am I supposed to abide in Christ and he in us? And so let's look at the next slide. Our, our first way to do that is to be secure in his salvation. When Jesus tells us to abide, he's not telling ourselves, he's not telling us that we must keep ourselves saved. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we are permanently saved in Jesus Christ and nothing could ever change that and we need to be secure in our salvation ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 says in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of the truth uh, the gospel of your salvation in whom ye also after that ye believed you were sealed with the holy spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance into the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory and so um kind of ironic we got something in the mail this week and mrs uh, and uh it was two, it, a two CD part, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm always up to listen to, to preaching and whatnot, and so then, then uh, there was a letter with it, and in that letter it said, and, and in the letter it said, this, this two CD sermon set or whatever is to put down the belief or the false teaching that once saved, always saved. I took those CDs and I broke them. I'm like, that is, a, that, that, that is trash. <laughs> um, that is anti-scriptural, and so we... We know through what this Bible says that we are sealed into the day of redemption. Nothing we can do can ever cause us to lose our salvation. We are sealed and secured in Christ. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so we need to be secure. If we want to abide in him, we need to be secure in his salvation. Secure in his salvation. Number two, we must remain in his love. We must remain in his love. Our abiding in Christ does not deal with our relation, um, does not deal with our relationship whether we are a part of God's family or not. Rather, it deals with our fellowship. If we are walking closely with the Lord each day, we must remain in his love. And so we are saved. And once we are saved, we are always saved. We can never lose our salvation. And um, and so it, that is not how we remain in his love. We don't remain in his love by knowing. It helps that, but, but by being saved. We remain in his love, or what, this, what I'm referring to is the fact that having a daily fellowship with him, walking closely with the Lord each day. If you were to look down in verse number 9, it says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus is talking to disciples. Then he says, Continue ye in my love. So we are to continue in his love. And I think of Romans chapter 8, 8, 38 and 39, where there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And so we need to remain in his love. Another quote from uh, Warren Worsby is, the abiding relationship is natural to the branch and the vine, but it must be cultivated in the Christian life. It is not automatic. Abiding in Christ demands worship, meditation, meditation on God's word, prayer, sacrifice, and service. 
but what a joyful experience it is. Once you have begun to cultivate this deeper communion with Christ, you have no desire to return to the shallow life of the careless Christian. And so this quote here is kind of, uh, that was a long quote, but what it's saying is it, it takes work. To cultivate a relationship with Jesus Christ, to, to remain in his love, takes work. It's not something that happens overnight, but it takes worship, it takes meditation, it takes prayer, it takes sacrifice, it takes service, but the rewards are great. And so first of all, we say we said we must be secure in his salvation, we must remain in his love, and lastly, how we abide in him is to remain under his leading. Remain under his leading. Christ abides in us through the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says it this way, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so we see here in Romans chapter 8, verse 9 that I just read, is that we are to remain under his leading. And we, and we remain under Jesus' leading through the Spirit of Christ or through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never leave us, but we must also choose to let him control us or let him lead us every day. See, when I wake up in the morning, I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, you know what I want to do? I want to do what my flesh wants to do. Hit the snooze and turn back over. Like, leave me alone. Uh, but... but we have to make a conscious choice to say no to our flesh and say yes to the Spirit. Uh, obey every single impulse of the Holy Spirit. And so we are to obey or we are to, we are to remain under his leadership, which is the following of, or the, the, following of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we, we sometimes know it's there. You know, there's been times where maybe we've, we've been out or out and about and, and we felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, you need to go witness to him. And we're like, yeah, I'm good. No, thanks. <laughs> and he's like, no, you need to go do it. It's like, I'll pass. I'll give him a track. It's like, no, 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 I want you to go a little bit farther than that. You know, sometimes, sometimes we have those urges and sometimes we have those, um, uh, those impulses. We are to obey those impulses. It's not always easy, but it is always worth it. It is always worth it. And so first of all, we see that abiding brings stability. And secondly, we're going to say abiding brings fruit. Abiding brings fruit. Uh, verse number five. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So our strength, as I said earlier, our strength is up and down. But Jesus is always the same. Our union with Christ is a living union so that we may bear fruit. But if we look at, if, if, if we were to take it from a step back, we have to realize this is not our fruit. It is the fruit that is born through the vine. It is born by Christ's spirit. Branches don't bear fruits of themselves. They can only bear the fruit of the vine that they are connected to. So in our lives, Whatever fruit we are bearing, it's showing what vine we are connected to, whether we're connected to Christ or not. And so, and so we need to make sure that we are connected, our branch or our lives are connected to Christ so we can bear the fruit that he wants us to bear. God is wanting to use us to bear fruit. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9, uh, it says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that wa watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive of his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And so God is saying, I want to use you. I want to use you to bear fruit. Psalms chapter 1 verse 3 says this, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf shall also not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And God wants us to prosper. God wants us to have fruit. And so he gives fruit two ways. The fruit of the Spirit, uh, the first way that, that we get spirit or get fruit is through the fruit of the Spirit. The sanctifying change that the Holy Spirit works in us is called the fruit of the Spirit. And so Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such 
there is no law. And so, and so the Lord, and, and so the scripture tells us if we abide in him, if our branch is connected to his vine, then these will be the fruits that, that are evident in our life. Maybe not all of them to the same degree. Like there are some people that have a lot of love and a lot of joy, um, but maybe not a, long, long, a lot of long suffering. They're not where they used to be, and they're growing, but, but not all of these are going to be the same. But these should be evident in your life, and there should be growth in, in your life in these areas. And so the, fruit of, so the first way that God gives us fruit, or the fruit of abiding in him, is through the fruit of the Spirit. And then secondly, we have the fruit of souls. God's plan for our lives is that we would multiply fruit, multiply what he has for us. John chapter 15, verse 8 would say this, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much, bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And so, so spiritual fruit is an eternal fruit. And not only, not, not only you know, I said, I said, I said the, the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of souls, but also in the fruit of the souls, a lot of times people automatically immediately jump to soul winning. And, and there's a level of truth in that. We should be multiplying believers. We should be sharing the gospel as much as possible. But another way of, of, the, of the, the fruit of the souls is actually to help other souls mature in their relationship as well. We can just, if we are to be productive in any way that we can, whatever God puts in our path, we are to be productive. This isn't solely just you should have these attributes and you should go soul winning. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, I'm saying these attributes come from abiding in him and then we should help other people get closer to him. And whether that is introducing the relationship or help the development of that relationship. And that will be an eternal fruit. A neighbor of a farm came by and, and he was talking to the farmer and he said, the neighbor said, how's the corn crop this year? And he said, well, I didn't plant, I didn't plant no corn. I was afraid of the drought. And uh, the neighbor's like, okay, well, how's your cotton, cotton doing this year? Well, I never planted any cotton this year either. I was afraid of the boll weevil. And so the, uh, the, the neighbor said, okay, uh, what about wheat? Maybe, how's your wheat crop? Well, I didn't plant no wheat. I was afraid of the blight. And so the neighbor asked, just thinking like, uh, do you do potatoes? How was your potato crop? And he said, I didn't plant no taters because I was afraid of the tater bug. And then the farmer added, friend, to tell you the truth, I didn't plan nothing because I was, I was fearful and playing it safe. See, a lot of times in our Christian life, we don't like to plant those seeds because we're afraid. Sometimes we're like that farmer, like, this could be bad, and so I'm afraid of the fear. I'm afraid of the what if, and so we reserve it. And we don't, and we don't allow, or we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. And so in our lives, as we are going, we must, we must be submitted to the Holy Spirit of God and allow him to lead us. It's not something that's going to be easy, but it's also, we don't want to live in fear. Because if we live in fear, we're going to get nothing. We're going to be like that farmer. We're going to have all this land and nothing to do with it. And that's not what God has for us. Sometimes we doubt that we could see fruit in our lives. And so what do we do? We do nothing for the Lord. And that is not the right response. And so ultimately, at the end of verse number five, Jesus says this, For without me ye can do nothing. So then, if I was to use my deductive reasoning, then with him, I can do it. Philippians 4.13 puts it this way. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And I know that's talking about being uh, content, but I think the, the principle still applies here. Without me, you can do nothing. So with Christ, in that relationship, we can do all things. And so this passage of scripture here, we pulled out three simple points. We pulled out number one, the source of our strength. And the source of our strength is the vine or Jesus. And so he is where the Christian goes for strength. Number two, we've, we, we, we saw the sustaining of our strength, the sustaining of our strength. And God sustains us through purging and through cleansing, through purging and through cleansing. Those are not always enjoyable times, are not always comfortable times, but as we've said many times before, the most profitable times in your life are often the most uncomfortable. The times where God uses us the most or is most evident in our lives are when we are the most uncomfortable. And then lastly, the stability of our strength. We are secure in his salvation, we remain in his love, we remain under his leading, meaning, we know we're saved, we have a daily walk with him, 
and we are continually allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us. And when we put those three things, three things together, we bear fruit. We bear fruit of the Spirit, and we bear fruit of the souls. And so in our lives, let's take a moment on this, on this Easter Sunday and just, just think to ourselves, am I abiding in Christ? Is he strengthening me? Am I getting my strength from him? Or, or am I focusing on the outside things too much? Am I focusing on things that I shouldn't be focusing on? Am I focusing on problems? Am I focusing on issues? Am I focusing on people more than what Christ has for me? And hopefully, hopefully we're focusing on Christ. If not, then just, then just re, then refocus. You know, every, every, every Sunday and every Wednesday, uh, me and Brother, Brother John, we, uh, we, uh, Johnny back there, we, we sit there and we focus the camera. It's not like the camera moves, but for some reason it comes out of focus. And we have to take the time to refocus it every time. Same thing is true in our life. We have to take the time. It just happens. We're sinners, and so we take the time to refocus and focus back on Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you for this passage of Scripture where you teach us about abiding in you, Lord, and how we get our strength from you. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that we, that, that, that happens. And we thank you for the fact that, that we are able to, to rest in you and to abide in you and to not, not leave. Lord, we're so thankful for, for the fact that you purge and cleanse us, Lord. And Father, I do ask that you would please help us refocus. What a wonderful time to refocus like on the day that we celebrate your resurrection and get, your, get our eyes pointed back on Jesus, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Another, another Easter in the books, and it may, may be different, may not be like the ones we've had previously, but hopefully, hopefully we took time and we lifted up the Lord Jesus Christ in our personal lives and we thanked him for all that happened. Um, a couple people have asked, and, uh, and, and so, um, and about birthdays and anniversaries, uh, we'll probably celebrate together again. Like when we're all back together, we'll, we'll just celebrate all the months. Just if you had a birthday this year, no, I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, I do know one. I do know the Mizakowskis had a anniversary yesterday. Eleven, eleven years, eleven years last yesterday. So congratulations to them. And I know that there's a couple more coming up. And so if you want that to be to be acknowledged, by all means, you know, send a text, send send a message on the on the page. We'd be more than glad to. Uh, to to mention that so um but that's the only one that i know of that happened last week so uh let's let's uh i'm gonna have a word of prayer and then we're gonna be dismissed uh just a reminder brother joe has his bible studies tuesdays thursday mornings tuesday wednesday mornings thursday evening and i'm gonna have one with the teenagers on third on tuesday afternoon so let's pray and then we'll be dismissed father we love you god you're so good to us thank you for the empty tomb thank you for your love thank you for all that you did to put into our salvation, Father. We're so unworthy, but we're so thankful. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name.